There was a man named George. George Whitfield uh, was a young man who was a bully, who was a thief. Uh, he was a drunk. He was a blasphemer. He would stand up uh, on bar stools and mock the preachers. He had an ability to communicate, but initially he was only using it to mock. He and his friends got drunk uh, at one point, and they actually came into a church like this, drunk, and upended the church service with their behavior. But George Whitfield had a call on his life. Uh, he was a guy who was going to be a kingdom man. Uh, and in the early 1700s, uh, when he got soundly converted, uh, he began to be used by God in what's known as the first great awakening. Such an awakening that 20% of the people in New England wound up, wound up in churches uh, because of George, the former drunk, the former thief, the former bully, the former blasphemer Whitfield. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, said as Whitfield would had a booming voice talk to crowds as large as 30,000 people at a time without obviously a PA system. Benjamin Franklin said he could be heard clearly a mile away, which is rather extraordinary. A lion, by the way, uh, a lion's roar can be heard a mile away. So God gave him some pipes there to belt it out. But my, my principle here is that here was a guy who would be discarded, who would be overlooked, who was not voted most likely to succeed. And yet God had a plan for his life. I just want to bring an equation in here. God is no respecter of persons. He values all his kids equally. We dedicated twins. I'm a twin. I have twins. Equity is very important to me as a twin, as a father of twins, to these parents of twins. It's important that we understand that God sees us as just as important, and that's really the message that Larry was bringing, just as important, just as valuable as anyone else. Different stewardship, different calling, different grace, different abilities, but a perfect combination of God-given talents, abilities, etc. that he wants to use. And if you're in this room today thinking, I'm average or less than average, I'm insignificant, there's no great grace on my life, what's the big deal? So George Whitfield had an awesome ministry, how does it affect me? I don't. Uh, there's nothing great or grand about my life. Uh, that very concept uh, is something you need tweaked because you're believing a lie right now about yourself. And simple math, simple understanding of a God who's all powerful, who's all equitable, who understands the gifts and callings. You know, I don't have to be a Billy Graham. As an evangelist, you know, I, I thought of myself, I wonder how I'm going to do what Billy Graham did. And I realized, you know what, I can't do what Billy Graham did. Uh, I just became the person God called me to be. Uh, and so I, we're talking about the kingdom, uh, what are you building, and the message today, part six of uh, this message series, qualities of kingdom builders. You're, if you're a, a born-again believer, you're part of the body of Christ, which means you're part of the kingdom of God, which means you are building something. Jesus said either you're gathering or you're scattering. You're getting closer or you're getting further away. But all of us are influencing not just ourselves, but other people as well. And so in the book of Hebrews, if you turn there in your Bibles, extra points for that, Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at some of the seemingly inconsequential, no-name individuals that God saw a quality in them that was so impactful, he put their name in the Bible. Um, and we're going to read about a few of them. Uh, and yet everything they did they did because of an invisible quality called faith. And the, and the gifts that God has for you are only accessible by faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. You cannot purchase anything of any eternal value without faith. And if, as Hebrews 11 says, faith is the very substance of everything you're hoping for, and it's the evidence of things you can't see yet, then you're going to need to, to learn how to receive and then transact that eternal faith that God has given us. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, by faith, Abel, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's first two children. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Abel did such a profound thing that even in his death, how he right now lived is speaking to speak to us today. 
Wouldn't you like to have a life that thousands of years later, people could be speaking about your faith and trying to emulate what you did? So what he did was obviously important because in this book of Hebrews, he's kind of like the first at bat. He's the first batter uh, that got on base, the first uh, uh, of two children being born. And he did something in such stark contrast to his brother uh, that his brother became jealous and his brother killed him. Tragic situation. But we're going to see between the two men why that happened and even the influence of the parents that we think precipitated what took place in this problem. And so number one, quality of a kingdom builder, uh, building according to God's pattern not yours. Uh, Abel built according to God's pattern and had a blessing and Cain did not and ultimately received uh, seemingly a curse through the whole situation. But the jealousy variable was really in part planted by the parents. The Bible says that the Pharisees, the, the Jewish leaders killed Jesus because of envy, because of jealousy. Uh, And this is the challenge. If you don't receive, listen, the gifts and the calling of God in your life, you're going to look over at someone else's plate and you're going to think you were shortchanged. You're going to begin to wish you had what they have. And that is a complete waste of your time. That's the beginning of a deception that could last your whole life. You could spend your life feeling shortchanged as opposed to appropriately believing what I have is the best. I remember reading the story about a a young boy who had a scar on his face. Early on he got a scar. Uh, And yet his parents began to speak into his life about that scar. And they were so effective in communicating the value of that unique imprint that God had given in his life that he literally grew up feeling sorry for children who did not have a scar on their face. Now you could say that God was so tweaked that he would have that perspective or did perhaps the parents accomplish something that was so profound that every one of us needed it in the room. You know, I didn't have a dad that spoke into my life about my value. I thought I was insignificant. So uh, I literally didn't even know I was more outgoing than my twin brother until I was in my mid-twenties. No one even shared about my temperament, personality, gifting, any of those things. Uh, And so I was more often thinking about what I wasn't than thinking about what I was. And so uh, jealousy as a parent um, can be either fed or dissolved by how you encourage your children. Here is a a Caleb feature I wrote uh, recently that talked about this Cain and Abel issue. Perhaps the most destructive attitude devastating family relationships is favoritism valuing one child above another. It started in the first family with Adam and Eve. Their firstborn son, Cain's name, meant, here he is, come on. And yet, his brother's name meant unsatisfactory. How would you like? One was elevated, here he is, and the other was deflated, here comes unsatisfactory. Actually, Abel's name literally meant breath that vanishes. Here comes breath that vanishes. You know, the Hebrew word is the word halitosis. That's the word. (laughs) A little humor there. Anyway, okay. um, It's no wonder that Cain was ill prepared for Abel's offering to God being accepted while his own was rejected. He'd been fed the lie, I'm more special than my brother Abel and therefore was unable to accept God esteeming Abel's offering as better. Favoritism led to jealousy and even murder down through the ages. And this was passed on generationally. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph all had favorites. To see the destructive results, just look at the Middle East. Have no favorites. Love and value your children equally and your family will be blessed. You know, we had on this platform a a couple of months ago a former Muslim man and a Jewish Christian believer and he had a revelation of Ishmael's value as they sat here together that he imparted to his Isaac descendant Uh, and the two of them hugged and prayed and it was such a beautiful thing because uh, unfortunately that value was not communicated to each one. And generationally, that hurt, that division, uh, that jealousy, that condescension, 
uh, ultimately produced the division that we see right now in the Middle East, which is between Arabs and Jews, basically the essence of it, those descendants of Ishmael and those descendants of Isaac. And so what did Abel do? Abel, the Bible says, gave God his first fruits. He gave God the first and best uh, of a sacrifice to God. Uh, Every time you have given your first, it's significant. Uh, The first time you prayed, significant. The first time you asked someone's forgiveness, significant. The first time you may have raised your hands in worship, big deal, significant. The first time you gave God the first fruits, perhaps in that first tenth, the tithe, significant. You know, the first time you did something, it was a maiden voyage. The champagne hit the hull. You were stepping out from where you once were, and you were becoming something new. Jesus Christ was the firstborn of a new creation. Not an accident that Abraham then was going to offer his son, Isaac, that God sent his son, firstborn, Jesus, a first begotten into the world. And, and yet what happened to Cain? The Bible says in verse 3, in the course of time, which literally meant in the end of days, Cain brought a sacrifice and offering of the fruit of the ground. You know, he, he didn't give his first and best. He was hedging bets. And many times we kind of look, when the Holy Spirit asks us to do something, uh, we kind of wonder, should I obey right now? And usually to me, the very simplistic comment is that I know it is God and not just my thoughts. My, my question is, do I have to? In other words, it's already gone beyond the weighing out of something. Do I have to is really the issue. And I realize at that point, it's just based on fear. There's no longer confusion. It's based on fear. And if it's just fear, I'm going to obey. If it's based on confusion, I'll slow down until I get more clarity from God. So that's Abel. Abel offered a sacrifice. His brother was jealous and killed him. Verse 5, by faith Enoch, another person, was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had scooped him up, had taken him away. But before, before he was taken, he had this testimony, he pleased God. And, and so the question is, how do you and I please God? Uh, in verse number 6, it says, but without faith, It is impossible to please God, to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So how do you please God? What is faith? You know, if God's this tyrant, he's this, you know, bully in heaven, you know, saying, I want you to do this and don't do that, or is he a God who knows ultimately with his creation what is going to make us all we really are intended to be. If faith somehow builds muscles that develop Christian character and Christian depth and Christian understanding that make us like God, when the Bible says God spoke the world, by faith he spoke the worlds into existence. If God used faith to speak the universe into existence, somehow that's a divine commodity that when God says, I want you to step out in faith, it's going to produce in us something that is timeless, that is precious. Uh, You know, one of the very simple things, the Bible talks in 1 Corinthians about three dimensions that are eternal, faith, hope, and love. I mean, the fact that you're going to need faith forever, a thousand, billion, trillion years from now, you're going to need some faith muscles to do something that is not yet happening. You're going to need hope forever. You're going to need a heart of love, which is the motive. Faith works through love. You're going to have the right heart. So if you're saying, I just want to get to heaven, you're missing the point of this dress rehearsal. You're missing the point of why you are still breathing right now because he's trying to develop in us. That's why I'm getting more and more excited about my time on earth because my opportunities to obey the Holy Spirit Um, are getting fewer and fewer on this planet. And I just want to be able to hear his voice, my sheep hear my voice, obey him immediately uh, without questioning. So number two, be willing to live to please God more than pleasing yourself. You're not going to hear that on the airwaves. Uh, They're not having... uh, soap operas or, or comedies or, or, or albums even made about uh, how do you can please someone else, how you can lay your life down for someone else. The world is self-absorbed. Obviously, the, uh, the God of this world, um, the enemy, uh, is self-absorbed, and he's trying to make all of us just these self-centered, self-absorbed, entitled individuals uh, that somehow think, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter... Uh, what you're wanting because everything 
uh, is ultimately yours to, the, to taking. I mean, I, I, just very simply, the problem with capitalism is you have greedy capitalists that are just selfish and consequently they just consume more for themselves. But the problem with socialists is you have naive socialists who don't do the math that at some point someone's got to pay for this. And you may have a $20 trillion debt, but hey, the chickens are going to come home to roost and you just can't say it's free, it's free, it's free, 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 free. Someone's going to pay for it. And, and by uh, allowing, in a sense, another generation to pay for it, only means the whole thing's going to go belly up and be bankrupt. And that has happened in history before, uh, where they've had wheelbarrows full of money that was worthless, that ultimately no one could get any value out of it. So just be wise in what you do, okay? Be wise in what you're hearing. Um, my father was a politician. Uh, he was a congressman for five terms. I know politicians, and I know the things they can say. They'll promise anything. Uh, but you do the math. You know, look, look under the hood. You know, that's where you check the teeth and make sure the horse is good. Anyway, number, uh, number three, uh, be willing to trust God without wavering. Uh, so what does it say in Hebrews 11.6? Uh, without faith it's possible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that God is who he says he is. Faithful, loving, worthy, trustworthy, kind, good, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Our number one issue is trust. I will guarantee you, if you come to me and you say, I've got a problem, that the root of it's probably going to be you trusting God. That's the number one problem we have, is that why are you disquieted, oh, oh my soul? Why are you struggling? Hope in God. Trust God. Believe God for your future. Uh, and I believe in any situation, God is bigger. God can raise the dead. God's not looking at your problems and challenges and thinking, it's insoluble, Francis. I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all you could ask or think. God's saying, when will you trust me to believe for your future? And that's where I want to develop, not just in myself. I'm happy. My life is a blessed life. I could die right now and be blessed. I just want to have more spiritual muscles. And I want to help more people learn to grow in the things we've been talking about because that can bless your life. I passed on, passed on a generational blessing to my children. And now I'm working on my children's children. But I, I, I'm believing that there is a, a victory that overcomes the world, the Bible says, even our faith. That somehow if you could trust God more than what you feel, what you see, what you're experiencing, believe for the impossible, you might be blown away, blown away by what you see. And that brings me to a guy named Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, things not yet seen. No one had seen the things he was preparing for. No one was going, Noah, you are really sharp. You're an innovator, man. You are like, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> no one was thinking Noah had it going on. Noah was a proverb. Noah was a laughing stock. Because people didn't understand Noah had tapped into something profound. And again, God always gets the last laugh. There's nothing. I sign every one of my emails. First it is impossible, then it is difficult, then it is done. A quote from Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China. Everything I'm believing for. You know, when I mentioned about um, wanting to help other cities, I do want to help other cities. I want to see Chicago and New York and Dallas. I want to see our nation transform. Yes, if you know me, yes with the revival, yes with the move of God. But there are practical things we can do and not just wait for revival to sweep down. There's some things we can do to activate, to generate the life of God. And so what did, Mo, what did Noah do? He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. No one understood, no one had ever seen what he was talking about. He was the only person who understood what was going on. And, and so that's why you following the crowd is the biggest waste of your time. Do not spend any time saying, I wonder what the crowd's doing today. I can learn from people. Very often I learn, uh, the crowd's doing that? Mm, no thank you. I will try and discern, even the, the great Christians or great Bible characters, I cannot do exactly what they did. But I can learn from them and I can say, you know what, that attitude, that response, that perspective can help me uh, in my own personal life. But my individual and your individual script is totally unique. 
There's no duplicate snowflakes, hairs in your head, or people. Everything that God makes is it one of a kind. And he doesn't make it and going, you know, I messed up on that one, sorry. Everything he goes, it is good. He created the creation, it is good. When he created the, your, the will for your life, his plan for your life, he said, that, you know, that script for you, pff, wow. I've never done anything like that before. That is the best combination of you I have ever done. Here's the deal, guys. I, I want you to so buy in this. You should, be, you should be on your feet cheering, clapping, sweating right now. You should be so excited about what I'm saying. I know, I know it's not going to happen today. In sincerity, I just want you to believe it. If I could say this, I think most Christians really waste much of their life standing by doors that will never open, believing for things that will never happen because their whole concept is based upon this is what I would really like to happen. And that is the beginning of sorrows. You know what you should really like to happen? God, I trust you. You are so good. Your motive is so good. I'm just going to snuggle with you. And I'm just going to dance. And the, when you move, I'm going to move. I'm going to make my life a joy. Because you, the Bible says in Psalm 72, you only do wondrous things. You're limited. You can only do wondrous things. So I'm just going to join you in the celebration of the wonderful plans you have for my life. We almost had... A serious clap, but not don't don't throw your backs out here. Number four, be willing to do the ridiculous in order to see the miraculous. <laughs> you know, there's no medicinal value in mud in someone's eyes. It wasn't magic mud. But Jesus obeyed the Holy Spirit and took mud, and somehow that act was profoundly obedient and activated something significant. You know, Peter getting out of the boat to walk on the water. I remember once, a number of years ago, God, in the middle after speaking in a church, God uh, asked me to get up in a restaurant packed with people and lead the entire restaurant in a prayer. And I remember at the top of my lungs, can I have your attention? Everyone, please. Now, if someone yells like that in a restaurant, you think something important is about to happen. And you don't realize how loud a restaurant is until it gets deadly quiet. But all of a sudden, and again, you think, did I want, I didn't want to do that. Who would want to do that? That's the last thing you want to do. But I remember sitting there as the Holy Spirit asked me to do it, and, and all of a sudden my pores were opened, and my body began to sweat. And I, all of a sudden I realized, do I have to? <laughs> In other words, it wasn't, it had already gone beyond what, it, what kind of thought is that. And so when they, and I, I just sucked it all up, guys, and I just said at that point, you know what? We're having a wonderful time here today. It's a beautiful day. I just think we should just stop for a moment and thank God. And so I then at that moment I bowed my head and just, just prayed a prayer Sat down. I am fully wet at this point, okay? My body is fully wet. And I was with another pastor. I couldn't even look up. I just began to kind of work on my food. And everything slowed down. I mean, it was like... But he looked up at me and he said, you know, Francis, you're an idiot. No. He said, he says, you know, I would never... I didn't go... Can I have your permission? The way it happened, he actually, I'm sitting there with him, I'm contemplating, should I pray in the whole restaurant? And he looked at me, without knowing any of this stuff going on inside my brain, and he goes, Francis, would you pray please? He was not thinking, would you stand up in the restaurant and have everyone pray? He, all he was wanting me to do was just pray over the food. But those words, would you pray please? I'm like looking at him, did you say, would you pray? 
What did you say that for? So when, when I sat there, he then says, you know, I would never have thought that what you just did would have been so peaceful. But it just like fit. The Bible says, as apples of gold and settings of silver, so is a word that's spoken at the right time. And then as the meal progressed, you know, I am like, I'm dying. Waitresses are coming over, customers are coming over, people are thanking me. It just worked. Now, I'm not saying today you're going to go pull that off. I'm just saying if the Holy Spirit leads you, you might be shocked at what He asks you to do. I'm writing a book right now, just finishing a book, a devotional called It's a Supernatural Life, on about 122 experiences like that where I've obeyed the Holy Spirit or someone I'm close to has obeyed the Holy Spirit and saw extraordinary results. There was a man named Mordecai Ham, not an average name. Mordecai Ham was a former boxer who got converted, became an evangelist, began to travel in the South, traveled with a tent, wanted to invite people to come to the tent meetings to receive Jesus, and yet he went into one city that literally told him, we don't want you in our city. We don't want you to set your tent up. So he parked his tent outside the city limits in a remote place, but gradually folks began to come, and after a while, a little young man, a teenager, 17 years old, named Billy Graham came and received Jesus because someone did the ridiculous and saw the miraculous. Someone just didn't take his tent and go home and quit. He was a fighter. He was a boxer. He continued to fight and obey and God did something extraordinary. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he received as an inheritance. And he went out knowing exactly where he was going and what was going to happen. Isn't that incredible? He knew exactly. He had plotted the whole thing out. He had a business plan. He had scoped it out. He knew what should happen and consequently because he was diligent and conscientious and worked the plan, worked the plan, fellow, worked the plan, God was able to bless him. Is that what happened? He went out what? Not knowing where he was going. How many think that's a great strategy? Well, if the Holy Spirit's in it. See, if you're looking for some verse in the Bible that's going to coincide with you leaning on your own understanding, you're not going to find it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do, 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 don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, no, no, don't, don't even begin to think. I mean, God gives us a hint. He goes, you know, you know your thoughts? Mm, not my thoughts. <laughs> but, but how do you know what I'm thinking? No, I, I already know what you're thinking and I don't kill you. I love you. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And you know what? Your ways, not my ways. Th that should be the beginning of your thought process of your confidence in what you think. Verse 5, be willing to follow God even though you won't know where you're going. That's a guarantee. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what's next. You don't know what should happen. That's how I live. That makes me fully dependent. I'm not just kind of leaning on God. If this chair collapses, I fall. I am fully trusting in Him. Yeah. It's called faith, being fully persuaded. Verse 9, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs of his promise of the same promise for he waited for a city whose foundation was, and builder was, maker, was God. Did he ever see that city on this earth? No. Some of the things you're waiting for you will see while you're here. Others will happen after. As I said, I received the Lord 44 years ago yesterday. May 14th, 1972 was Mother's Day. Today it's, it was last Sunday. But May 14th, 1972, my mother's prayers were answered. And I was dramatically, radically converted, the first of her five kids who would ultimately come to the Lord. When our house sold, it sold on Mother's Day weekend. Our house just sold now. We have to be out of our house on my mother's birthday, June 14th. I know my mother's prayers are still powerful. So my mother did not see on earth the fruition of all her prayers. But her prayers are stored up in heavenly vials being poured out my whole life. I believe poured out generationally. I believe my children, maybe my children's children will be experiencing the prayers of a godly mom. So 
I guarantee you some of the prayers you are praying that are in obedience to God's will and word will be answered, but some of them will not be answered while you're on this earth. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself, someone come to the keyboard if you would, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. Again, she's an old lady. A child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. God, you are faithful, for you have need of patience after you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. What do you need right now? You need some patience. What's patience? Cheerful, hopeful endurance. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Oh my God! It's going to be so awesome! How many of you are excited about your future? How many think God is excited about your future? How many want to join with God's perspective about your future? I am here. I'm the guy with the paddles. Do you know I will stand before God for you? And if I'm going to do this little milk toast, silver lining, fluffy little stuff to try and make you feel good about your lousy perspective, <laughs> I'm not going to help you. Every day my perspective needs to change. I want to finish well. I want to finish reading the book of Hebrews 11 and not think, yeah, right, that could happen. I want to read it and go, Lord Jesus, I want to be numbered amongst them. Number seven, believe God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Pastor Bob, and I didn't know he was going to mention Burma. We don't mention Burma here a lot. But the nation of Burma didn't have one known Christian until a man named Adoniram Judson went there many years ago. And he spent years there and never saw one convert. But and, and as Noah didn't see one convert. But Adoniram Justin, after he died, a government survey a few years later determined that one in 60 Burmese, which was 210,000 people, were Christians because one man was willing to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. A nation was jump-started from zero. Verse 12, therefore from one man, Abraham, and him as good as dead. You know what? Again, wine, I'm not a wine drinker, but they say again, the, the more aged a bottle. I mean, if you see a bottle of wine and it says 2016, not incredibly valuable. But if you saw 1716, it would be very valuable. Well, ultimately, Abraham, his faith, was so powerful. The Bible says, was born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand on the seashore. And it mentions all the very next verse, all these people you read about, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. How many of you are ready to die in faith, not having received the promises? It's going to happen on a certain level. I want to believe to see, even though I might not see it on this earth. My mother, you know, I don't know the weirdness. People ask me because I do memorials and things. You think my son's watching, my mom? You know, I don't know. I just tend to think, well, yeah, there's movie nights in heaven. I don't know how that works. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me that the cloud of witnesses Hebrews 12 talks about would not encompass some of our loved ones who are watching at our faith to believe for the impossible. Don't pray to them. <laughs> There's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. But I do believe my mom is aware. It's just my deal. I believe that. These all died in faith, not having received the promises and have, having seen them afar off, were assured of them. They far off embraced them afar off 
and confessed, just like I'm confessing, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in this world. I am an eternal spirit being having a temporary natural experience, but I'm going to live forever. And so I'm putting all my chips on the eternal realities that cannot be taken away. And I'm letting my soul be so transformed that the confessions this mouth make, this mouth makes, are consistent with the eternal word of God and not the silliness of our culture and society where the God of this world is ruling them. Maybe 6% of the people on the planet right now are born-again Christians. Don't follow the crowd, folks. Verse 14. And obviously people who talk like that are not are looking forward to a country that they can call their own. Verse 15. If they had meant the country that they came from, they would have found a way to go back. And let's read verse 16 together. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a heavenly city for them. Would you all stand together? You know, I'm not a perfect vessel in communicating this, but I feel really good about a few of the sentences I said. And I feel like I was crawling into your hearts and crawling under the hood to try and make you, once again, I love you. Some of you have been Christians too long. I love you. you got to get born again again. <laughs> and God can create situations like that. You could have a white-knuckle situation where you've got to believe God for a loved one that is in desperate trouble. Well, you got to believe for your own health. I mean, I'm not waiting for catastrophe to strike me in order for me to believe God's Word. Amen. Have I seen that? <laughs> I've seen people who have never prayed a prayer, praying hot prayers with tears coming down their face. Because all of a sudden, they suddenly need God on His terms. And I'll tell you right now, folks, we need God right now on his terms. And our nation needs God on his terms. And your family needs God on his terms.